We should invent more powerful antibiotics versus uh, different pathogens, and then we should put them in a closet uh, with a glass uh, yeah. a cover and only to be broken in case of an emergency, uh, but rather not use it because it is the overusage of antibiotics which is now leading, again, through evolution uh, to resistance and leaves us in a very, very vulnerable uh, situation. We have a really interesting topic to talk about here today. Um, it is the next superbug. And what does that mean? Um, well, we actually took a look at this about a week ago in the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report. And the new era of biological risk was actually one of the main risks identified for the year ahead. So today we're going to have a conversation about what that biological risk looks like. What are some of the different um, issues that we should be looking at when talking about solutions. And so we'll be looking at different topics in global health security, one of which, what does it mean if another epidemic is on the horizon? Another, what, what does it mean for rising antimicrobial resistance, infections coming increasingly prevalent? And the third, um, questions around vaccine hesitancy and what that means for our overall preparedness and response. So I'd like to take a moment to introduce my, my guests here today. Um, to my left, uh, Dr. Richard Hatchett, who is the Chief Executive Officer for the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations, Nor Norway. Um, next we have uh, Professor Heidi Larson, who is a Professor of Anthropology, Risk and Decision Science for the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the UK. And, and next we have Mr. Lars Sorensen, who is the Chairman of the Board of Directors for Novo Nordisk Foundation Denmark. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So Dr. Hatcher, I'd like to, to really start, um, start with you and ask you a question that is increasingly on our minds um, this week in particular, um, the world has seen a growing number of epidemics in recent years, Ebola, Zika, SARS, and now we're hearing reports of the coronavirus outbreak in China. Could you speak a bit about the likelihood of these events becoming a global threat and, and how prepared are we to respond? Well, I, thank you for the question. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very timely question, obviously. Uh, with the emergence of the novel coronavirus. Um, I've been working on epidemic threats and epidemic response for about 20 years, uh, both in my current role and previously in the U.S. government. Um, I think the, the risk of epidemic disease, you talked about the increasing number of threats. I, I think that is a real uh, phenomenon. I, I don't think it's that we're increasingly attentive to them. I think it's a real phenomenon. I think it is related to you know how societies are currently organized in the in the complexity of societies their their the speed with which people move around the world changing modes of interacting with wildlife species climate change as as a as a factor driving the emergence of new disease so i think it's actually a structural mm -hmm. threat and it will be a structural threat for the foreseeable future i think it's also uh one of a, of a small class of transnational threats that require collective action to be addressed. Um, I think the concern is that the diseases that, we're, that we see emerge have a, I, I would almost say, a Darwinian imperative to, to find you know, communities where they can break out and propagate. And Ebola is, is, is a great example. Um, Ebola was discovered uh, more than 40 years ago and there were 20 or 25 outbreaks uh, between its discovery in 1976 and the huge outbreak in West Africa a few years ago. And, and what you saw over that period of time through those outbreaks was a disease that was gradually expanding its geographic range and looking for communities where it could propagate and ultimately found in West Africa sort of a perfect setting in which you could have a large explosive outbreak. And, and now we're in the midst of the second largest outbreak of Ebola ever. So the two largest Ebola outbreaks ever have both occurred in the last five years. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Now we're seeing the emergence of a third coronavirus. SARS is, was the first coronavirus that we had significant concerns about. It broke out in 2003. 
MERS came along a decade later, neither of those viruses was very easily transmissible. They, they were transmissible. They caused a lot of disease. But we knew that coronaviruses as a class represented a threat to humanity. And, I, and what people are concerned about now with the current coronavirus is perhaps this is the coronavirus that we've been fearing, which is one that is more easily transmissible than SARS or MERS, and with a lethality that is sufficiently high that if it became a, a, a globally disseminated disease could potentially you know, affect a very large number of people and potentially cause tens, hundreds of thousands of deaths or even millions of deaths. And that's a really frightening prospect. It, just to conclude, I, I think we need to acknowledge that these epidemic diseases are in fact a, a structural threat for the societies that we've created for ourselves and we need to take the appropriate steps to prepare for and be ready to respond to them. As just a brief follow-up, is there anything in particular that we, we can do to prepare for when, when and, and, and if we, we see this cross-border flow of, of these outbreaks? Well, ab ab absolutely. I mean, I, I think it, it requires, you know, cross-border collaboration. It requires, you know, establishing transparency in reporting as a norm. It requires developing new technological capabilities to develop definitive countermeasures like vaccines very rapidly. That's actually one of the reasons my organization was set up uh, a few years ago here at Davos. Uh, I, I, you know, I think we know what we need to do. The question is whether we have the political will to do it and whether we choose to allocate the resources that are required. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'd like to now turn Turn to you, Mr. Sorensen, um, to speak. Uh, we're, you know, we're talking about the, these outbreaks, and one element of perhaps a response is talking about the drugs necessary to to, to actually take take into effect to do something about this. Um, but we're also seeing this growing um, case of drug resistance, and I'd love to to hear from you. You've written about that antimicrobial resistance is actually one of the most serious threats. To, to humanity today. Um, why is it such an urgent threat, and, and what do you think we can do about it? Yeah, it is, uh, it's actually just making what we just heard even worse. It's, it's, a, it's a different set of problems. Uh, here we're talking about our ability uh, to, uh, to combat uh, bacterial infections. And uh, I would say, so this, the epidemic of, of viruses is an, is an immediate, emergence of a huge threat. This is more like a s slow moving tsunami yeah. uh, where uh, human life as we know it today uh, might not be the same kind of life we see just 30 years from now. Uh, the reason being it is, is if you think about safe childbirth, if you think about uh, surgery, if you think about uh, immunotherapy for cancer and many, many of the medical interventions uh, that makes our lives longer and more healthy, more productive, uh, might no longer be possible if we do not invent and preserve new antibiotics. And, and there is a, a dysfunctional marketplace because in reality, we would like these drugs never to be used. It's like a fire extinguisher. Uh, we should invent more powerful antibiotics versus uh, different pathogens, and then we should put them in a closet uh, with a glass uh, yeah. cover and only to be broken in case of an emergency, uh, but rather not use it because it is the overusage of antibiotics which is now leading, again, through evolution uh, to resistance and leaves us in a very, very vulnerable uh, situation. So. I think, and we can come back to solutions of how we, we might deal with this, I think it's a problem that we can solve. I mean, I, I think uh, the epidemic uh, threat um, might be more difficult uh, to deal with, uh, also because the immediate effect is so large. Uh, but when I think about the climate uh, 
crisis that people is talking about and think think about this, the size of that, the complexity of that, the cost of that. Um, this 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 lack of of new antibiotics is something we can fix if we really want it in collaboration. But we can come back to the solutions a little bit later, perhaps. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, um, Professor Larson. Uh, Let's turn for a moment to the, the social and the political side of this conversation. Um, yeah, we really would be helpful to understand kind of what are these factors that help determine how we respond. Um, and I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts in understanding the recent rise in vaccine hesitancy and what really, how this contributes to global health crises and, and what you would suggest should, should be done to, to combat that. Well, I think that um, there's a few things. I mean, this societal and political issues um, contribute to the spread of diseases as much as efforts to mitigate them. I mean, Ebola is classic. I've been working closely with uh, Richard's team on, on an Ebola vaccine trial and working on the community dimensions, the trust building and whatever. And um, I think that you know politics is is can be messy and can interfere with efforts to get in to to deal with the situations. Um, but there's something that's even more basic that um, is is about just individuals and communities, and that's vaccine acceptance. And we really were were slipping in our global um, vaccine efforts. We did really great. I mean, when you think about it, it's not too long ago. I mean, in 1980, um, we only had 20 percent of the world's children were getting the basic six vaccines. That's not that long ago. And then there was a global concerted effort to get that up to 80, 85 uh, percent. It was amazing. But we're, we're stuck there. And we're actually dropping in some countries. And it's almost like we've reached a saturation point and in addition to that, in the meanwhile, we have a lot more than six vaccines. We've got combinations of vaccines. We have a lot of vaccines. But we also have a much more questioning public. And I think that um, there's a lot of things that are converging right now that I, I, it's, co it's about complex threats. I mean, there's the whole digital revolution that has added a whole level of opportunity on the one hand, and yet. Um, threat. I mean, the Global Risk Report, the 2013 one, um, coined this term digital wildfires in a hyper-connected world. I've, I've referred to that phrase a lot. And actually, I really like the parallel to wildfires, particularly right now when we look at what's happening in, in Australia. One of the things the physicists and engineers have said about trying to, you know, analyze these patterns of these new fires, and what they've said is, they're burning hotter, faster, and less predictably. And I couldn't think of a better metaphor than some of the diseases, but also what's happening in, in vaccine confidence and vaccine resistance. These connected networks of people who are from uncertain to resisting vaccines, not necessarily because of the vaccine, but because of what they represent. They're uh, regulated and mediated by government. They're produced by big business. They're often mandated. They have chemicals in them according, I mean, they're not, not natural, as some of them say, when in fact, actually, I think we need a new brand for vaccine because they actually kickstart your natural immune system. Couldn't be better. And it's not like pulling up to a, a petrol pump and getting, you know, a, a lot of chemicals in your arm. It's more like a mosquito bite, frankly, and it triggers your own system. So I think that we need to do much better now, before the next big outbreak, to get people's confidence back in vaccines. Because one, if we prevent a lot of these um, Current, currently circulating diseases, we won't have to use antibiotics. I mean, it's one of our best f feet forward in mitigating the risk of AMR um, when you've prevented it in the first place. So the more we can prevent these diseases, the more we can keep these mm -hmm. strong antibiotics in the fire 
in the break, in, <laughs> only in a fire cabinet. Yeah. Fire cabinet. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that's that's an important. We we actually had a panel last year at 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 uh, the WEF on on this whole issue of social media and the loss of confidence and trust in in authority uh, and science in general, which has led. And, and yeah. contributed, and this is exactly what you were yeah, alluding to, yeah. contributed to this uneasiness on certain, in certain communities uh, of taking uh, public health advice and, yeah. and taking uh, vaccinations. Uh, and uh, this is very sad, uh, and, and it's, it's pervasive. It's, it's not just in health areas. It's a, fake news dissemination. It seems uh, to more become the norm than, the, uh, than an anormality. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and, and, and I think Heidi, made a very important point, which is worth underscoring, which is how particularly with vaccine hesitancy, but even to some extent with antimicrobial resistance or, or with epidemics. I mean, th these are kind of represented here. These are the three great narratives, you know, in sort of infectious disease yeah. at the moment. And then each of them underneath, and I think you, you outlined it for vaccine hesitancy very well, brings together a constellation of narratives that interact in ways that are very unpredictable and then you superimpose digital wildfires and social media and it becomes really, really toxic. And, and so you're about to see, I would predict with Wuhan, mm -hmm. you're about to see social reactions that are probably going to be disproportionate to the current threat mm -hmm. at least and they're going to cause tremendous damage in much the same way that you see social reactions to these narratives swirling around vaccine yeah. hesitancy. There's also the issue of timing. Right. I mean, this is happening on the, I mean, Friday is New Year's Eve for the Chinese. This next week is like the biggest traveling time um, of the year. So this could have happened in the middle of the year and it would have been different. But the timing of these things is, mm -hmm. is you know, often, um, and that's not predictable. Right. Um, I mean, also, you don't want to have outbreaks or introduce new vaccines mm -hmm. around political elections. You know, I mean, there are certain things that you you don't you want to try to keep things as least complicated as possible. In DRC, our challenge is also there's conflict in security. We haven't eradicated polio uh, because of conflict in security in the northwest frontier in Pakistan and in northeast uh, the Boko Haram in, in Nigeria. It's no coincidence that they're harboring the remaining wild virus in the world. And by the way, polio is coming back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've had the, the, back, the Philippines case. It's come up now in Malaysia. Um, we had a case in Ukraine a, a few years ago. Uh, you know, this is something where we're like almost there, but it's really such a, um, it's, I've been working on polio for a long time. I mean, I used to have UNICEF's global uh, immunization strategy and communication for introducing new vaccines, but also for initiatives like polio. And um, it was, we didn't have the security issues that we have now in Pakistan and Nigeria. It was actually, we weren't even worried about Pakistan. We were more focused on a small section in India and a boycott in Nigeria, and which we resolved, but we wouldn't have been able to do that in the current environment. So the other thing is things change. Things can change. Your setting, if you're, you know, you do your plans and, you know, you do your five-year plan and we'll do this then. But stuff happens. Um, we didn't plan for the digital, I mean, we didn't anticipate some of the aspects of the environment we're working now when we planned or, or uh, produced uh, certain new uh, vaccines and antigens, so. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I think it's raised a lot of questions around, um, around uncertainty and unpredictability uh, across, you know, across global health issues, you know, real large in terms of um, preparing for the next epidemic, you know, understanding political considerations, timing issues. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, questions around, well, are the drugs we're using today going to work for, for tomorrow? So I think 
I'd love if you if you could each share briefly um, just a note on on the preparedness aspect. How do you prepare for something that is so filled with this this uncertainty? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll start. I mean, I think in in the domain of epidemic diseases, where you're talking about newly emerging epidemic diseases. There is a lot of uncertainty. You can't predict what the next disease is going to be by definition. You can't predict when it's going to happen. But you, I think you, from a preparedness perspective, and, and this goes back to the point that I was making about these being sort of an, a, a, an inherent risk in the societies that we've constructed for ourselves, there, there is a, almost an actuarial Risk and you know we we saw NEPA in 1999 and SARS in 2003, H5N1 in 2005, H1N1 in 2009. These things, you, you, they're all different. You can't predict what it's going to be next time, but but they're coming along at you know every two to three, maybe four years at the outset, and the the risk tolerance of society for infectious diseases is is has decreased dramatically. And part of the reason it's decreased dramatically is because the disruption that they cause because of the interdependencies within society, the economic costs have become astronomical. In 2015, there was a MERS outbreak in South Korea. It caused 186 cases. That's a lot of cases. It caused 36 deaths. But it led to the closure of 2,000 schools. It led to the disruption of the tourist economy in South Korea. It probably caused around $10 billion of damage which is more than $50 million per case. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so if that's the risk, we need to take steps to prepare for it. And, and even though we can't predict what the next disease is going to be, we know what the components of preparedness are. And we can invest in the components of preparedness. And it's surveillance capability, it's public health capability, it's laboratory capability, it's the ability to rapidly develop new definitive medical countermeasures like therapeutics and vaccines. So we can, we can invest in those capabilities if we internalize that this is a recurrent risk. The problem is that people historically have not perceived the class risk, they have perceived the individual events. Mm -hmm. And so when SARS comes and goes away, you forget about it. When Ebola comes and goes away, you forget about it. When Zika comes and goes away, you forget about it. People are not perceiving the pattern. And so they're not making the necessary investments. I'll, I'll just finish very quickly. I like to analogize with cybersecurity risk. 30 years ago, when computers were not connected, people tended to discount cybersecurity risk. They knew computer viruses existed, but you had to insert an infected disk into your computer in order to get the virus. So people discounted the risk, and they didn't make the investments in cybersecurity. In our interconnected digital world now, that would be suicidal. People have now internalized the class risk. They don't know what the next computer virus is going to be, but they accept that we have to be prepared for them. So they mm -hmm. now routinely invest in what's required to be prepared for it. And they do patches as soon as new vulnerabilities are identified. We need to take that same kind of mentality and apply it to biological risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I was thinking also about um, you know fire companies. We all think of <laughs> you know the engines and the loud sirens when there's a fire, they're there. Right. But that's not the only thing they do. I mean, fire departments are spending a lot of time thinking about strategies and plans and and systems in place, um, getting hoses in the right places. You know, this is the firebox. Um, so I, I think that's a very primitive analogy in a way. But I think from a, from a vaccine front, I mean, I, I mentioned things like that, but I'm thinking back about 9-11. Um, I was in New York, I was, well, that's when I was at UN headquarters. We realized that as a UN, we were very busy um, with, particularly with UNICEF, in uh, being prepared for emergencies in a lot of other countries and our offices. They had never thought that something would happen in New York. They didn't, the heads of agencies across the UN agencies mm -hmm. did not even have each other's mobile phone numbers unless they happened to have asked for it. We didn't have a plan. We didn't have an evacuation plan. I mean, we had like for fire, but there were things that, you know, you, you kind of think it's over there, the risk. Um, and just after that, we had the anthrax and then there was avian flu.
And then there was a whole series of things that were like, whoa, wait a minute. And a lot of simulations were going on. But I think at a very simple level, do you know your neighbor? Do you know what you would do um, if you needed to, if all of a sudden, because there was a, a circulating virus, you couldn't leave your house? Do you have anything, extra food or water in the house? Do you know, do you have a plan to contact family members? Or do you have a place you would meet? Or, you know, simple things. Just think about your own situation. Have you talked to your neighbors? Do you know, you know, how you as a f family or friends or whoever you're, you know, s something, some kind of network? The other thing is in, we sh I'm, got worried that we're taking down so many phone booths because when 9-11, it hit the cell tower. Mm -hmm. We couldn't count on the cell phone. I mean, I was lucky. I still, I still had a landline in my apartment, and I happened to be living walking distance. I mean, I had a lot of colleagues who were really um, stranded and couldn't call, and phones were down. There were landlines. So I think we need, you know, we shouldn't be so dependent on our mobile devices and have a plan B. What, how, what would you do if you didn't have, it, it was all the lines were cut, which is a very real possibility. Um, and not just about the connectivity. I was at a, um, in a session with the head of the International Red Cross, Red Crescent, and they were saying for some of these refugee populations that they'll be on the other side helping them move through. The one thing that people want to give before they go into an uncertain setting is their phone. Mm. Only, not nothing to do with connectivity, they want them to save their data. They don't want the, uh, the government or the situation they're going through or to to get hold of their contacts. So do you have backups for your contacts that aren't dependent on you having your mobile phone? Do you have it, frankly, I'm sorry to be so old fashioned, <laughs> is it somewhere written down or at least the core important ones? I mean, I think we need, uh, this is serious stuff. Um, we, need, we need to be more uh, reflective of what would happen if I didn't have X or the water stopped, or the water was the infective agent, do we have something else? Yeah. On that happy note. <laughs> yeah, well, it is interesting. I, I just uh, attended a session uh, where His Royal Highness uh, Prince Charles was, was talking about sustainable uh, business community. And uh, John Kerry, the former uh, Secretary of State of America was attending, and he made the point in terms of being able to deal with the climate crisis that, in his view, to deal with it, we need to be at wartime footing. Mm -hmm. That's how serious he sees this. In order for society to develop the necessary technologies uh, to deal with carbon capture and, 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 and new technologies can replace the fossil fuels. And so, in this whole context, I would say uh, that that I have a somewhat easier solution uh, to the, the long-term uh, replenishment of, of antibiotics that are not functional today, because uh, we, we've invested $150 million in, in trying to develop new scientific concepts and startup companies uh, with new ideas. Uh, this has stranded not because of lack of scientific progress, but it has stranded because if we were successful, even our foundation, and we work together with the Wellcome Foundation, uh, we would be bankrupted because the cost of developing these drugs through the regulatory phases would be prohibitive. And then, oh, by the way, if we succeeded, uh, th there would be no recuperation uh, of investments. So what is needed to develop new antibiotics, which we can then keep in the fire safe, uh, if we have good stewardship, uh, would be additional risk-willing capital uh, provided by foundations like my own and other uh, foundations from, uh, from governments uh, and from the pharmaceutical industry, which has, even though it is not their responsibility that there's not a market, they, they have the capabilities of 
making their resources available to solve a problem where I would advise them to do so because they would be seen as taking a public interest for once and not just uh, a corporate interest. And, uh, and then we need to have the regulatory process amended uh, and adjusted so that we can have a, a faster regulatory approval. And then finally, we need the national states, regions to, to look at a subscription model whereby they subscribe to the availability of new drugs, even though they may not be using them. And the companies would be obliged to provide these and have safety stocks, but preferably not use them. And this is in a, in, in a very simple thing to do compared to uh, the complications uh, that has just been described by epidemics. I mean, I can only, I mean, I wouldn't know how to deal with that other than try to work on the plan B <laughs> that you described, Heidi, of, of making sure I have food and water and, and my bicycle is pumped and, uh, and whatever uh, we can do on our own. So the anti, uh, microbial resistance problem can be dealt with. And it is not very costly. There's just not any marketplace today. Yeah. Well, thank you. I know I have many more questions, but I'd like to take a moment to offer it up to the audience. Um, if we can just take uh, these two questions here, and then we'll... Um, Mr. Hachet, um, uh, there is also one patient in the U.S. that is also diagnosed at the same uh, disease uh, that's discovered in China. So um, the disease is really like cross-border. So given your knowledge about the White House and your background, uh, so in your opinion, uh, should China and the U.S. work together on this? Will they be able to work together on this? And if yes, uh, what kind of medical me measurements they could already uh, possibly uh, take? And uh, um, Mrs. Uh, uh, Larson, uh, you speak about the individual role in fighting against this, this kind of uh, uh, a big crisis. And uh, we know in China that uh, China has a long tradition of, a, of a using antibiotics. And now there's already kind of like a um, panic that a lot of uh, season will just run out and buy antibiotics, which is not necessarily helping with the cause of this specific type of virus. So what, what is your suggestion, you know, as an individual we could uh, do to help the community uh, in facing this kind of a crisis? And uh, uh, Mr. Sorensen, um, you speak a little bit about the corporate responsibility already, but I still want to know, you know, like from the corporate uh, perspective, um, um, what kind of role you think from a big pharmaceutical company could possibly take in this kind of a situation, you know, um, uh, uh, to ensure the access of the medicine for ordinary people instead of just cashing out of the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's Thank you. take one more question now. I just want to follow up questions about the investment in this virus protecting. Is there any suggestions to for the you know public uh, sector to follow that you know cyber? Um, because it's quite different. How to put those pressures on you know in the public? Who could do those investment? Government lead those investments or companies? What kind of any you know people would take that? option to, to do those investment. If you'd like to, to start with just the, perhaps that final question. Sh sure. Investment protection. So I, I think the, the sources of the investment are, are necessarily going to be multiple. I, I think there does have to be private sector investment, but there very clearly has to be public sector investment. And I think an important source of investment could be philanthropic capital, which doesn't have the same kinds of constraints that private sector investment or even governmental investment by elected officials will, will face. I think a ver another very important thing to explore, and this is something that has been explored in the cyber world, is the regulatory environment. The, some of the necessary investments in cyber, for example, have been shifted from the end user to internet service providers or to banks, for example, in terms of fraud protection by new laws or new regulatory requirements. And I think the problem with epidemic preparedness right now is that it is all sort of left to the end user and, and, and left to specific individual countries. And you need new governance that appropriately moves the incentives to where they 
can make the most difference. It's, it's a complicated story, but I think, I think you have to have all three sectors. You have to have private, public, and philanthropic capital working together. I would argue that governments have the most important role. The question that you asked about can China and the U.S. work together, you know, China was unfortunate in that that's where the epidemic started, but it is now a global problem. This is not China's problem, this is the world's problem. And China and the U.S., even despite the current tensions that characterize parts of the relationship, both have incredible scientific capital, scientific resources, and they do need to be working together because they will accomplish much more, much more rapidly working together than they will if they continue to think through a national lens. And similarly, to come back to your question, governments have to recognize that individual governments working by themselves will not be able to solve this problem. They have to pool their resources and pool their efforts. That's actually a fantastic transition. Um, if we could turn to, to you, Lars, about the, yes. the, the corporate side. What's the private sector's responsibility uh, and, and role here? Yeah, I mean, the, as I think I stated, the, in relationship to uh, the antibiotics market, the antibiotics market have collapsed, uh, becoming generic, and uh, prices have become so low uh, that they cannot profit uh, create enough profit to warrant uh, research activities into uh, new and improved antibiotics. So then you ask me, uh, what is the role of the pharmaceutical industry? So it's, it is not, you cannot really directly hold the pharmaceutical industry responsible uh, for taking action. Uh, but it, it reminds me of, I think it was a quote by Dante uh, that said that in time of crisis, uh, the hottest pl place in hell is reserved for those that remain neutral. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and this just reminds me of the capabilities that the pharmaceutical industries have. Yeah. Uh, they can contribute in both financially, but also skill-wise. Uh, they have the technologies uh, that are required to develop new antibiotics. They have manufacturing capabilities. Uh, they have patents, uh, science, which they have invested in over time, which they consider proprietary, uh, which could be bring to the, uh, brought to the fore to solve this problem. So uh, I'm encouraging uh, all participants in the life science industry. This can be other players as well, uh, people from the medical device industry, others that have capabilities in life science to step forward and help us solve this problem. This is, I think, the least problem that we're facing. And, and Heidi, if you, if you would uh, give us the final word on, on the last question on, on sort of community uh, preparedness. I think just um, uh, your question was uh, the Chinese using a lot of antibiotics. They're not the only ones, but I appreciate what you're, you're saying. Um, and, and how to deal with, um, how to mitigate the risk of, of AMR. Well, aside from, I think the biggest thing is trying to prevent the infections in the first place. But I also think, I mean, shifting more to the community role, um, just I think you need people to encourage each other. Uh, and, and this needs to be, this is not about individuals. This is about, you know, a contagion. This is about the keeping communities alive. This is about keeping nation states alive. And I think one thing that really concerns me with the whole vaccine hesitancy thing is that it's just a, another symptom of underlying issues of the iPhone, I, I personalization of pretty much everything. Um, but that's not the way the world is going to survive. I mean, vaccines, when you think about, touch every single life on the planet. It is the greatest social experiment in cooperation. I mean, we depend, the whole, the whole model of vaccination depends on cooperation. So it's really putting us to the test. And frankly, for any kind of resilience, we're going to need cooperation big time. So that's my final comment.
Well, thank you so much to, to all of our speakers here today. If I may put my uh, fireman's helmet on uh, for a moment and try to summarize uh, the topics we've talked about today, I think three main points stood out. One is preparedness. Um, the second is the importance of building trust. Uh, and the third, uh, as, you, as you put it just now, is the importance of collaboration and cooperation. So thank you so much again to the speakers and to those of you uh, joining us for this session. Thanks.